my last video, I upgraded my 286 system to a 386 SX. And I did some basic testing just to see if I could write to a two line LCD with the, the help of a programmable peripheral interface or PPI. And that was working. So I validated that I could read ROM, I could use my RAM, I could use the PPI and get content onto that two line LCD. Uh, but there's a lot more in my system that I need to make sure I can test and see if it works fine with the 386 or if I've introduced other issues. And so here's my system as it sits today and I've added in or added back in my VGA card that I built and my IDE interface card that I built. And I'm going to go ahead and boot up the system here. And I'm going to pause it at this point and just point out a couple of things. Uh, first of all, on the LCD, you know, I'm still controlling that the same as I was before. The data on it, though, is coming from the real-time clock, and that requires SPI communication, which I am doing through bit banging, and I'm leveraging a versatile interface adapter, or VIA, to actually do that connectivity between my 386 and the specific real-time real clock here that I'm using. And so that all seems to be working, and that's a good sign that my SPI communication works because I'm doing quite a bit of stuff with SPI on my system. Uh, also notice way up top, there's a little OLED screen, and that screen is just showing some post tests that passed. And that's being controlled with I2C from this little nano here. And I communicate to that nano through SPI. So from my 386, I can basically make a call. It goes through the VIA to the nano, and then the nano writes out to that OLED screen. So that's working. That's also a good sign. So a couple other things on the SPI side. I do also notice that over on the lower right screen, which is just kind of a debug output, on that screen I'm seeing that I am A, getting content. That's coming from this same nano. So I make SPI calls to the nano to write to the PC. And in this ter terminal program, I can see the output. But in that, I can see that my SD card test also worked, and that is more SPI functionality. And that SPI call goes down to this SD card in the lower right of my system board. Uh, so, so far, all of this seems uh, on the right track. Uh, maybe one other thing to point out on my system board, I have a, a nano down in the lower left, and that is managing all of the PS2 communication for my keyboard and mouse. And as I move the mouse or press a key, it raises an interrupt and then sends the data through SPI, uh, or basically the processor would request it from the Nano so it knows what key or what mouse movement has occurred. And you'll see that uh, the keyboard works here. I'll show that here momentarily. I'm not doing anything with the mouse yet uh, with this current build. But I've got my, my video card, my VGA card that I built back in. I've got the IDE interface card back in my build. And I'm turning on the system and I'm reading the CF card that is on that IDE interface card. And you can see I'm starting to boot up to FreeDOS. Uh, maybe a couple more notes before I resume this. Uh, I am running the 386SX with a an internal clock of basically a processor clock of 8 megahertz and I'm running the system at 16 megahertz or just just slightly above it the crystal isn't actually a 16 it's a 16.3 or something like that uh, but close enough I'm running essentially an 8 megahertz processor I have noticed with the 386SX I can't go much above that at least not in the configuration I have in the system today and I'm guessing it's because I have additional logic that has to convert some 386SX signals to 286 signals like S0 and S1. And I have an extra set of address latches in there. Uh, and that basically is adding up my overall latency. Uh, by the time the 386SX puts an address out there and I latch it, and then I have to latch it again on the 286 board, uh, between that and other output enable signals, uh, it seems like I've, I've kind of hit a limit to have a 16 megahertz bus and 8 megahertz processor. And I'll continue to play with that. Maybe that will change, but that's what I'm running for the moment. 
Another important note at this point, I did pull out the math coprocessor. So with the, the 386SX in there, it does not just work with the 286 math coprocessor without some changes. And the primary change is I would need to implement some some just some modifications, minor modification to my decode logic for when the math coprocessor is enabled. The I guess the way I understand it is the 386SX is going to use address line 23 along with an IO and MIO signal to determine if it should be communicating to the math coprocessor. And on my current 286, it's looking at a different address, uh, IO address for the math coprocessor. So that decode logic will have to change. And then there's also a pair of command signals coming into the math coprocessor that it seems like I need to change those around a little bit. They're not just the same as they would have been uh, coming from the 286 to 287. Now coming from the 386SX to the 287, I have to make some modifications there. And then I just have to validate if this will work with all the timing of the rest of the system. I'm really not doing much with the coprocessor yet anyway, so really I'm not too worried about it for the moment. Um, but this will be in my backlog of something to try to come back to and get that working oh, and see if I do need maybe a little type of an interposer board with some minor modifications uh, or if I'm just going to do some bodge wiring to make those changes where I need to physically change something around. Uh, but more to come on that later. And so if I continue the boot here, uh, you'll notice that it then loads FreeCom, which is the command interpreter for FreeDOS that I'm using. I can do a directory and look at what's on my CF card. And I'm going to go ahead and change into a folder that I have here, uh, REHSD. I'm going to quickly clear my screen. And I have just a little C++ program I wrote to add two numbers. I know it's super exciting, but it's a simple test that my C++ programs are able to load and run okay so that seems fine uh, i have another utility here that i'm going to run and that uh, utility is a graphics test and in, in some older videos you might have seen me use this uh, but basically i'm going to load up this graphics test and choose number three which is to load a test image and so it's going to load an image off the cf card and Compare, relatively, I, I guess, compared to previous versions, this is loading faster than ever. So it's uh, part of it is because I'm running a faster CF card. It's a 32 gig card. And uh, that card I can use from FreeDOS without problem. I'm going to go ahead and resume this. The next thing I'm going to do is just maybe, uh, you know, change to a different folder and in this case, I want to change to the FreeDOS bin folder. I do have a bug in how I, how I process the enter key, so I've got to go track that down. Sometimes it doesn't register until I hit the following key and then it double registers, kind of like you see it did here. Um, so that's one of many bugs in my backlog. Here I'm running Edlin just to see if I can run one of the FreeDOS utilities. I'm going to insert a couple lines. So this is a test and another blank line and a dot to get out. And that all seems fine, and I'm going to go ahead and quit out of here. So it seems like I can boot FreeDOS, I can navigate around, I can run my own C++ programs, and I can run some of these simpler FreeDOS utilities. Uh, now, there are some things I can't do. Like here, I'm going to try to use the FreeDOS shutdown, and it's going to expect that my system has certain interrupts implemented in the BIOS that I don't have there around uh, basically power management type of stuff to the lower right, it's showing me what is it looking for. And I'm logging that it was asking for an interrupt 15 and interrupt 16. And then I think that last line is it's an interrupt 21 that it was looking for. I don't have those implemented. So it is basically just set up to log it when I get a call to an interrupt that I don't support. So those are interrupts I can now go back and try to implement. Maybe another comment, previously in an older video on my 286, I was booting to FreeDOS and trying to run some of the games. And I'd get an error that you needed a 386 to run the game or run the program. Um, so now I'm past that, so I can now go to those uh, simple DOS games and try to run the DOS game, and I don't get the prompt about the 386 requirement. 
but then I'll hit a wall when it's looking for a certain uh, video interrupt, for example, that I don't have yet implemented. But this is going to help me identify. I can get in and try running some of those and see what, which interrupts it's trying to, to leverage and then go in and implement those interrupts in my BIOS and try to can keep building out basically this system. And all of this is going to be helpful in my 386DX build because I'm going to need the same types of things. Uh, so this, this is a good build up and, and continuing to work towards uh, my 286 now slash 386SX system and apply a lot of what I'm doing here to my 386DX build as I continue to work on that. Uh, so I think that's it for now. I have a lot more work ahead of me, a ton of graphics work ahead of me yet. I still have a lot of BIOS interrupt work and a backlog of bugs that I can work on little by little as I have time and energy. I do have two other cards yet though to pop back in. I have my sound card that I built and I have a, a another memory card that I can put in and access another four mega memory through a 64K window. Uh, and so I'll, I'll probably start leveraging that card and the sound card and the extra two general registers that come with the 386SX plus the 32-bit uh, registers, which is nice. So I think I have some BIOS code I can optimize and make a bit better. And we'll see where it goes.